So thank you everyone for attending today's talk, which is on unorthodox command and control channels. <clears throat> so my name is Tabraz Malik. I work at PwC within the ethical hacking team. And if anyone's interested in knowing more about what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, feel free to come over to our stall outside. And this specific research uh, project has been formed from the research and development arm of our cybersecurity business unit. And as a bit of background to myself, prior to working at PwC, I was helping develop software at Rolls-Royce to support their high-performance computing operations. And as a quick overview to today's talk, initially, uh, I'll be discussing the types of communication channels that both historic and modern malware used. Then we will look into some unusual ways that attackers have already leveraged communication channels in the wild. And this will then naturally lead me into my contributions to some novel command and control channels. And finally, we will then discuss the ways that we can actually defend against these communication channels being successful. Now, <coughs> command and control channels come up in conversations within both the offensive and uh, defensive uh, aspects of cybersecurity quite often. However, I feel like there's an overwhelming amount of research that's been, and focus that's been carried out on more traditional channels. However, in order to best protect the public, in order to best protect organizations, we need to look at identifying the types of technologies that attackers will likely look to use in the future and defend against these. And in order to best provide some commentary over this area, we need to know the strengths and limitations of the types of defensive controls that organizations have rolled out today. Now, a command and control channel is the medium in which an attacker is able to communicate with an infected machine. And more often than not, an attacker usually requires the victim to communicate back uh, in terms of posting command output back to the attacker. And of course, at the same time, there is a subset of malware which doesn't require communication channels, those being dubbed as destructive malware, wipers. However, on the contrary, if we look at the more active APT groups, for instance, a big component of their attack operations are cyber espionage campaigns. And if we dive deeper into cyber espionage, data exfiltration is a key component. And if we then transfer that to the penetration testing domain, equivalently, in red team simulations, upon receiving an infection, the ability to have that back and forth communication is critical. And hence, if the communication aspect of that attack chain has been detected, then that effectively dissolves the entire attack chain. And that emphasizes the vitality of command and control channels. And if we take a look at the way malware has evolved over the past 20 years and pay specific attention to the kind of change in momentum of communication mechanisms that attackers have used, there's been a varied change. If we go all the way back to 1999, there was one of the first recorded instances of an IRC-driven piece of malware, which was called Prissy Park. However, as the internet evolved and as HTTP evolved in its own rights and became more well-established and more well-utilized, attackers quickly realized that there's a reduced amount of effort in setting up maintaining and operating a HTTP-based communication channel versus that of IRC. And again, it wasn't uh, surprising that attackers had made that lateral move to HTTP. However, when we look back in time, uh, at any point when attackers evolved their methods, organizations also began to impose stricter controls. And with the rise of web proxies, uh, techniques such as SSL stripping, organizations began to inspect traffic at a deeper level in order to prevent users in their network from accessing certain destinations. And this then resulted in attackers moving towards DNS-based communications. And this kind of edges into the area that we're in uh, today. And of course, it's not only attackers who are using communication channels like these. If we look at the pen testing domain and popular tools such as Cobalt Strike uh, supports communication channels such as HTTP, HTTPS, and of course, DNS. And at the same time, attackers have moved towards more new and emerging technologies, those primarily being social media sites, such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and also cloud services, such as Google Drive. And the main point here being that attackers have begun to use more creative, imaginative ways to leverage communication channels and have moved away from kind of raw, traditional HTTP-based channels. 
And before we dive deeper into the main crux of my research, I'd like to bring your attention to the main kind of categories of detection that software vendors have focused on. And of course, there's been a huge amount of evolution in the types of products that have touched the marketplace. However, there is still widespread dependency on a content signature-based approach to detecting malicious communications. And if we look at intrusion detection systems, they are quite effective in the cases where a signature has been developed for malicious communications for a known piece of malware. However, they suffer from almost a loss of vision and sight in the cases where a signature hasn't been developed. Um, and this is kind of a similar point to Sir Ricardo rules, um, snort rules when it comes to network communications, where if something's been written, then these uh, detective capabilities can flourish. Um, however, their practical effectiveness deteriorates quite heavily if the signature isn't there. And if we take a look at modern firewalls and deep packet inspection, in quite busy environments, so the type of networks that most organizations that we all deal with today, it's computationally demanding and resource intensive to analyze the payload element of every single network packet that's passing in and out of your network. And given the fact that most organizations don't have infinite resources, it's not really a realistic way to capture uh, any unknown new threats in the communication aspect. Another area of a focus that vendors have focused on is heuristic-based detection. And a good example of that is Microsoft's uh, Azure Security Center, which has a heuristic DNS uh, capability. And this works, well, the detection model is based on n-gram models. And in a nutshell, what this allows is for Microsoft to analyze domain names on a character-by-character -character basis. And so by feeding in many legitimate domain names into this model, a sequence model is then established that can then take another domain name as an input, and it can then decide whether that domain name is legitimate or whether it is with high probability malicious. And the final kind of direction that vendors have moved towards is behavioral-based analysis and anomaly-based detection. And this is definitely edging in the right direction. However, some of these tools, I won't say all, some of these tools are quite sensitive in their nature, where if information is coming in in the right formats and if the operating environment is exactly what the tool expects, then they can be quite effective. However, if there's a deviation or information is coming in in a different uh, format than expected, then the operational effectiveness of these tools are questionable. And there's also a practical challenge that's associated with these kind of behavioral-based uh, detection tools, which is actually positioning these tools in the right areas of an organization's network. So putting them on the right endpoints in order to provide correct visibility. And of course, if a tool doesn't have the right view, then it can't protect against new threats. So now that we've discussed the more prevalent communication channels, those being HTTP and DNS-based, we can now look at some more interesting, unusual communications that have been adopted by attackers in the wild. I remember around six years ago, I was working in quite a large investment bank, and one of the first things that I did was try to access Facebook, and I quickly realized that access had been denied. But if we fast forward to today, we see that many organizations will permit access to social media sites, and many organizations will have internal marketing teams who manage the social media presence of an organization. And this can be useful for accessing new markets, accessing new customers. However, social media sites can also be used for malicious, unintended purposes. And Hamatos is a piece of malware that used Twitter as a command and control channel. And the way Hamatos worked was it used a domain generation-like algorithm to generate Twitter handles. It would then use the Internet Explorer com object to go out and then visit those actual Twitter pages. And for the Twitter handle that the attacker intended to use for the attack, there would be certain tweets that would be posted to that timeline. And the tweets would, uh, tweet, sorry, would follow a specific structure, that being a domain name followed by a hashtag, as we can see below. And the hashtag is composed of a number, which is actually a data offset, and a string, which is actually a decryption key. And the reason for this is the attacker would host images with encrypted content onto these uh, domains. And now, 
Hamatos will then reach out, download all the content from the resulting page, which would include this image. And by inspecting the Internet Explorer browser cache, it would look for any images whose file size is equivalent or greater to that of the data offset. Hamatos would then extract the command out of the image through visiting the data offset and using the decryption key. And the encrypted content would either be uh, credentials for a cloud storage service or it would be an actual command to execute. And the reason for this is Hamatos used Twitter as a one-way command and control channel and it would then exfiltrate information through a cloud storage service. So following this same method, it will then use these credentials, execute the command, and post the information back. And this poses some interesting challenges to SOC analysts. Uh, let's assume the case where a reverse engineer, for instance, tried to analyze the binary. Because no communication infrastructure information has been hard-coded into the binary, this wouldn't read any effective results because the infrastructure information was being fetched from a secondary source. Now, if a SOC analyst tried to find a tweet, then they could, of course, find out more about what actually happened in the attack. But if an attacker deleted the tweets, or if they went one step further and deleted the entire Twitter account, then this would hamper their analysis. Additionally, if an analyst was able to actually reach out and view the image, if they didn't have the data offset, or if they didn't have the decryption key, then again, this would make any analysis that they intended to carry out a lot more difficult. Moving on to steganography. Now, steganography is often associated with images. However, steganographic techniques can also be applied to text and videos. And the amount of information that you can implant within that chosen data medium depends on the type of steganographic technique that you've chosen to use. And in stegogram is a proof of concept that researchers proposed not too long ago that combines steganography through images and the popular social media platform, Instagram. And the way Instagram worked was, it, <coughs> an attacker would first set up an Instagram account that they were in control of. They would then use steganographic techniques to embed the command information within an image and upload that to that account. And that image there just uh, show the LL command being uh, implanted within, within an image. The Instagram infected machine would then reach out to that Instagram page, fetch the image, and extract the command. Upon executing that command, they could then follow a similar steganographic technique that the attacker originally carried out to then implant the command output information in a new image and post that back to Instagram. And in this way, it can then leverage this two-way communication. Finally, Jason Reeves from Fidelis uh, posted a bit of research about how X509 can be used as a command and control channel. And in a nutshell, the way that this can be thought of is within TLS communications, there's certain areas where you can place arbitrary data. These areas being these X509 extensions, an example of which is key usage. Um, some other examples there, extended key usage, subject key identifier, there's quite a few extensions, essentially, that you can use. And by using self-signed certificates and using an environment where there's a failure to properly inspect certificates, Jason showed how you can transfer arbitrary data. And this specific image from Jason's research shows the popular binary Mimikatz that I'm sure many people in the room today have had practical experience with and transferring that through this uh, X509 communication mechanism. Okay, my kind of contribution to this research area has primarily been focused on developing command and control channels that can be feasibly leveraged within a corporate environment. So by placing specific focus on new emerging technology that has crept into the workplace, and by coupling my research with a threat intelligence driven approach, I've pulled on the depth of experience from PwC's threat intelligence team to analyze and study the types of malware that attackers, and specifically the communication mechanisms that attackers have used, and to then analyze the types of methods that attackers will likely look towards in the future. We'll start off with GitHub. Many of you, I'm sure, have had practical experience with GitHub, and GitHub has been quite vital in allowing software engineers to collaborate quite easily on software projects. 
And given the fact that GitHub is in quite widespread use and it has a massive user base, it means that it has quite excellent capabilities as a command and control channel. And of course, you could argue that some organizations restrict access to GitHub, which is true. However, I'd still say that the majority of organizations permit access to GitHub, and there are still quite a few that prevent access. And my proof of concept works by using the GitHub API and a private repository as a command and control channel. The activation message will be a specific string that's included in a Git commit, and all subsequent communications are then made through Git comments for that particular Git commit. And a public channel can work equally as well. It's just for this proof of concept, I've gone down a private route. We'll now move on to the video. Okay. Now I have my Crescon 2019 PwC private repository. And on the right now, there will be its uh, virtual machine, which will be infected by my malware. I believe I called this git and split. And so at this point, the infected machine is looking for an activation message, which hasn't been posted yet. So I will now make a modification to a file and I will provide the activation message in a specific string, which we will now see. So here I provided the C2 active message, which has now been committed to the repository. And on the right hand side, we will now see that the activation message will be received by the malware. And now the malware begins to look for new commands to execute. And I followed a certain syntax where commands have to be prepended with a string, which is git and split, in order for the malware to understand that it's a command to execute. And so here I've executed, issued, sorry, the hostname command. I'll quickly skip through until it's registered. And now the command has been executed by the malware and it's posted the output back to the repository. And following this format, I've now issue, I will now issue a few commands to show this back and forth communication. So the who am I command has now been executed. And the output is then seen on the left there, which is PwC to Braz, SlyWin 10. Now we'll now execute the calculator process followed by the explorer process. And there we go, the explorer process has now been spawned. And in order to terminate the malware and delete all contents of the communication, the attacker can issue a command uh, which is delete, and this will then terminate the malware and remove all contents. And on the right, we've now seen that the malware has now terminated, and all communications have been removed. <clears throat> if I go back to that same example of six years ago in the investment bank, the main form of communication was email. However, if we fast forward to today, many collaborative tools have now entered the workspace. The most proliferant type, I'd say, is instant messaging applications. I know many organizations today have multiple instant messaging applications within their organization. And the reason why I focus on Slack as a command and control channel is firstly, it has a widespread user base. But secondly, and the point which is more contextually important for building a command and control channel is that Slack's user base is widely composed of paying users, which means that Slack exists in many organizations in that corporate context. And that means Slack stands as quite a lucrative command and control channel. And the proof of concept similar to GitHub uses the Slack API, and I've used a public Slack channel um, as my communication means. The activation message is a specific string which is contained in the channel and all subsequent communications again will be published to the channel itself. I've also added a human simulated element to this channel whereby once the attacker has achieved their, the goals of their attack, they're able to then initiate a conversation with a bot and the video next will show how that conversation plays out. And I'd also like to mention here that I completed this proof of concept about a year ago, and around last week there was a piece of malware that 
was reported to use Slack as a one-way command and control channel and would then use GitHub to exfiltrate uh, information. And this further emphasizes the point of this talk, that attackers will use the types of channels that we expect them to use. And so this type of research and having this kind of conversation is definitely beneficial for the longer term. <coughs> so if I now show the video. On the left, I have a Slack channel. So I've given it a Marvel-based profile, which will become relevant later on in the video. And on the right, we have an infect the machine, which is to be infected by the Slack malware. I will also show a Reddit stream, which is actually used for the human simulated conversation. And that Reddit stream is about a Marvel related conversation. So on the right, the machine Slack has been infected by Slack and Track. And it's now looking for an activation message. Now on the left, I will post an arbitrary message to make the point that activation messages are specific and it will only be activated upon receiving that certain message. That message being C2 active. And now on the right, we see that the activation message has now been read by the malware. And now I'll begin to issue commands. So I've issued the hostname command and we now see the output, which has been executed by the infected machine and posted back to the Slack channel. Similar to the GitHub video, I will now do a back and forth of a few commands being executed. So we now see the who am I command has been uh, executed. We've now issued IP config. And on the left, we see the output of the IP config command. And then similar methods to before, I now execute calculator followed by explorer. And now in order to delete all evidence of communications, in case an analyst, for instance, tried to look at the contents of the, uh, the conversation, we can now delete everything through that issued command. And now a human simulated conversation will now uh, commence. So Alice is a bot and I am using myself as the additional member of the conversation. And on the right now, I'll skip through this, but this just makes a point of a load of messages from that Reddit stream being now posted by the attacker and bot into the channel. Now, now I will now make the point that this is actually coming from GitHub, sorry, from the Reddit stream there. And this conversation will then continue for a while until the malware is happy that sufficient contents have been posted to the Slack channel. And once it's happy, it will then terminate and exit, which we see on the right. And now if, it, if a SOC analyst or somebody from the organization was trying to look into the attack, all they'd see is this Marvel-based communication, which wouldn't look that suspicious. Now, moving on, if we look at the community-driven element behind software engineering, if anyone's gone past writing a Hello World program, and I'm sure there's many code gurus in the room today, I'm sure that you've ended up on Stack Overflow. And in the context of web development, it wouldn't take you many Stack Overflow questions until you reached a question where someone has contributed an answer and there's been a mention of a JS Fiddle link. And JS Fiddle allows you to share and collaborate on code, that namely being HTML, JavaScript, and CSS code. And the element behind JS Fiddle that makes it extremely valuable as a C2 channel is it has a public functionality where you can create a public fiddle, which is anonymous. There's no identifiable information that's tagged onto the creation. And the fiddle in itself is persistent. And the format of JS Fiddle's URL is the initial component followed by a unique identifier for your fiddle and a number, which essentially points to the version of the code. And when you post your initial source code, that will be the first instance. If you then make a slight modification to the HTML code, for, for example, and press save, the URL will then be updated to version two. And my proof of concept demonstrates how by updating the specific areas of the fiddle itself, you can leverage this two-way communication channel, which is persistent and anonymous. So on the left, I have a public fiddle that I have created. And on the top there, we see the unique identifier followed by the number one, which highlights the first version of the code. 
And on the right hand side, the machine is now infected by the JS Fiddle malware, and it's now looking for a activation message. So in this case, the activation message is Fiddle then Riddle. So if I now add that into the chat, sorry, into the, the source code for HTML, we now see that the, the Fiddle has been updated to version two. And now the infected machine is looking for commands to execute. Similar to the previous proof of concepts, I will now issue a command, which is hostname. And the syntax that I've employed for this proof of concept is the command has to be prepended and appended by a DX exclamation mark. That's how the malware will figure out that it's a command that's been issued. Now if we update the fiddle, and now see that the malware has updated the HTML component of the fiddle and the output of the command is then seen. If I now issue the who am I command, we will now see similarly, the infected machine will see the command, execute it and update the fiddle. Now if I update to six, we'll now see the output. And in this way, JS Fiddle, one of the downfalls of it is the kind of inherent version control element. So you can go back and see the previous versions of the code by simply changing the URL. And you don't really have any control over deleting that fiddle. So the anonymity element is slightly hindered. And finally, if I issue the goodbye uh, command, the malware will realize that it's time to terminate and it will gracefully exit which is then seen on the right-hand side. Okay. Now, cryptocurrencies and blockchain have gathered a lot of momentum over the past few years. And whilst it's highly unlikely that organizations will permit access to these kind of applications anytime soon, because of the fact that these technologies are quite new, organizations most definitely are kind of researching into ways that they can leverage blockchain-based technology uh, in order to further their corporate goals. And the fact that organizations may in the future permit access means that attackers could look to using these blockchain-based technologies as a command and control channel. And this proof of concept uses PWCoin, which is an internally developed cryptocurrency. And it's a separate project that also formed off the backbone of the research and development uh, arm of our cybersecurity business unit. And PW coin is based off of Litecoin, which is of course a fork of Bitcoin. And the way that addresses work in all these cryptocurrencies is if an address is valid in a valid format, it can then be associated with a transaction. And I'd like to also mention here that the proof of concept communication that I will show next is reproducible on other cryptocurrencies. It's in no way isolated just to PW coin and this lab environment. And my two-way communication channel works by encoding command and command output information in a format that is also a valid PW coin address. And what this means is you can then issue a malicious transaction. And if a block containing that transaction has been mined, that information will then be propagated onto the blockchain, meaning that any other nodes on the network will also be able to see this information. In this example, there'll be three nodes on the PW coin network. So here I just show the PW coin client, which I'm sure many of you recognize. Uh, and it's similar to that of Bit, uh, Bitcoin client. And at the moment, there are zero active connections. I will now add the attacker control client, which is on the right-hand side. So this will be uh, characterized by myself, who will play the attacker. And on the left, we will now have a victim machine, which will be infected by the PW coin based malware. Now, the way that this proof of concept works is the attacker and victim machines will recognize that an address is contextually relevant by looking at the first few characters of the address. So anything that starts with PFVE will be either the command issued by the attacker or the output of a command issued back in response uh, by a victim. So initially there's no uh, addresses on the blockchain which follow that syntax. 
And on the right, the attacker is about to issue a command. <coughs> We've now issued a who am I command. And on the left-hand side here, there's been a new transaction that's been created and the associated address begins with PFVE, which is the encoded format of who am I. And once a block containing this uh, transaction has been mined, this information will then be visible by the machine on the left, which again is another member of the PW coin network. And in order for this to occur, mining has to uh, currently be occurring. And on the left-hand side, we now see that the victim machine has now seen a new address, which begins with PFVE, and recognize this as a command to be executed. And now the victim machine has actually executed a command automatically, uh, which has sent out a transaction. And again, that same format of PFVE has been followed. So now once the attacker has seen this new information, they will identify that a address following the PFEE format has been seen, and they will identify that that is output to a previously issued command. And on the right-hand side, the attacker has a loot.txt file, and we can now see that the output to the whoami command has now been uh, received. And the same method, I will now issue the hostname command that is being written on the bottom right-hand side. And in a second, once this has been executed, a new transaction once again has been created. And following that exact same process, the victim will then receive that command and issue a response back to the attacker. And through this back and forth, you can leverage these two-way communications. And finally, I do issue a IP, a if config command, sorry. However, given the limitations of the amount of information that you can actually hold within an address, this is one of the, the massive downfalls of this type of uh, communication channel. And it is still feasible to get a larger output. However, it would just take a longer amount of time. On the right hand side, there on the right, I end the video by issuing that if config command. Okay. Now, like any road to resolution, there's always less effective and more effective ways in order to fix a problem. So initially, we'll look at the less effective methods of detecting malicious uh, network communications. So a lot of organizations will manage domain whitelists, which dictate trusted destinations effectively. And these will normally be complemented by characterization rules. And whilst this may deter a relatively low-skilled attacker, given the fact that content delivery networks are more than well-established and the technique of domain fronting is more than well-known, this means that a well-versed attacker with a higher skill set would have a higher likelihood of bypassing domain whitelist. And this means that any intrinsic value that domain whitelists present from a defensive perspective can be nullified, again, by a dedicated attacker. And if we look on the flip side at a blacklisting approach, and I will use Slack as an example, since Slack is representative of the way that most software vendors will engineer their software. Slack requires access to all domains that end in slack.com. And of course, you could make an argument of collating every single FQDN that Slack uses and only permitting access to these and your workspace. However, let's say that Slack modifies their operational model or how you access workspaces, then of course this could result in you breaking access to Slack. And whilst this could be a temporary solution, in the longer term this is quite brittle and is likely to break. Another option that many organizations may seem as a lucrative quick win is to impose stricter firewall rules. And this might seem like a good idea at first glance, however, and when you take into account the realistic element of firewalls and managing firewalls, there's a large amount of effort, resource, and time that needs to be expensed in properly managing these. And given that many organizations have quite liberal firewalls, which may become overly permissive when you look at all the firewalls in aggregate. And again, this opens a possible opportunity for malicious communications to kind of leak through your network. 
Now that we've looked at less effective methods of detection, we can now discuss more elegant techniques in order to detect new unknown uh, threats in terms of communication, of course. Google have proposed a method which is focused on analyzing transport layer information. And this is actually on, the basis of this is a characteristic of both modern and historic malware, which is periodic beaconing. And most malware authors will design their uh, malware to periodically beacon back to the attacker in order to bypass stateful firewalls. And Google's detection model works by collecting network traffic from connections on a network and applying certain data transforms to look at that data from a different perspective and view the data in terms of the frequency of connections. And for beaconing traffic, there will be a massive spike in the amount of network traffic associated with that single connection compared to legitimate traffic. Cisco have proposed a different method, which is based on fingerprinting TLS metadata. And the premise of this is looking into TLS communications and the fact that in the client hello message, there's a lot of unique information uh, in terms of the kind of TLS configurations that a developer has set that can be fingerprinted. And by building a supervised machine learning framework, Cisco have fed in lots of legitimate TLS traffic to which you can then compare uh, new traffic against that model for it to decide whether it's malicious or not. And again, this is a move away from the content signature approach and hugely based on the behavioral semantics of the communications. And another good example of behavioral analysis done well is Logic Hub and Palo Alto Magnifier. So Logic Hub works by analyzing GitHub audit events and imposes behavioral inspection. It looks into things like suspicious behaviors uh, exhibited with a certain GitHub repository or previously unseen check-ins or previously unseen commits. Um, and this just makes a point of the wealth of information that you can get from just looking at behavior. Palo Alto's magnifier follows a slightly different model for detection, which is still behaviorally based. And this works by analyzing processes, and it has a concept of process chains, and it can be thought of analyzing or reviewing the overall life cycle of a process. And there's an additional concept called uh, peer group profiles. Now let's say I'm in a marketing team and I have eight others in my team as well. Uh, Palo Alto the Magnifier has now developed a peer group profile for the day-to-day -day activities of this marketing team. Now let's say that I've been infected by the JS Fiddle malware and Magnifier now sees a non-browser based process. That's now initiating an outbound connection to JS Fiddle and there's lots of back and forth communication. This deviates quite significantly from the kind of expected profile of my peer group uh, composed of marketers. And in this way, an analyst can then go forth and look into the types of uh, behavioral detection that was noticed by the tool and carry out further investigation. Now there's a lot of future work um, and additional work that can be carried out in this domain of communication channels and malicious C2 channels. For instance, I've shown a fairly basic method of simulating human conversation. However, there are better ways that you can fine tune this and make this more representative of real human conversation. Additionally, I've just touched upon some interesting methods of detecting malicious activity based on uh, kind of behavioral characteristics. Uh, but once again, there's lots of methods of applying machine learning based techniques and data science driven techniques to analyzing certain behavioral characteristics which haven't really been explored yet. And finally, there will forever be new types of technology that enter the workplace. And I've touched upon a few in my proof of concepts today. However, there are still many that uh, exist and many that are to come. And some examples of other areas that you could explore include JIRA and Slido. So when helping an organization in order to develop a stronger security posture, there's often a piece around security awareness. And that's definitely still the case here where there needs to be a heightened awareness by organizations on an enterprise-wide grade about the 
malicious connotations of seemingly benign software. And by specifically identifying the types of software that your organization identifies as critical, and then further identifying the ones that have a capability of establishing outbound public connection to the internet, you need to ensure that they are appropriately hardened and secured by the use of the types of detection models uh, we spoke about earlier today. And this talk most definitely doesn't support a claim that every single machine learning based uh, detection tool will be effective at detecting new communications. That would be a lie. Um, however, by complementing your core defenses with these behavioral based solutions, you will definitely be in a better position to detect new unknown malicious threats. And finally, the penetration test is in the room, which I feel is the majority of people today. You can, when you go back to the office, you go back to your organization, you can definitely begin to initiate that discussion internally about how the types of technology that you interact with on a day to day basis can be used for malicious purposes, uh, specifically in the scope of command and control channels. So I'd like to thank everyone for listening to my presentation today. If anyone wants to see the videos or wants to ask any questions about the deeper technical components of today's talk or the proof of concepts, I'll be around later on today. Uh, so feel free to grab me outside and I'll be more than happy to have a chat. Thank you.